What's that? Hey, you see that? When the war came to an end, on Victory Day, there was a meeting with the Americans. I saw a large body of water, boats floating. So we had a meeting on the 9th and the 10th. Cars stood in a row, crammed full of products. Also there was vodka, wine, beer, whatever you wanted, whatever the soul desired. Whilst Ukrainians in the Soviet army were on the River Elbe with their American allies celebrating the end of the war, Ukrainian insurgents were preparing to continue the struggle against the communist regime. Our company had a radio. We heard on the radio that the Germans surrendered. In honor of this, there was a prayer service. One of the kaplans said a prayer for our fallen Ukrainians. After this, we began to bring order to our territories. In the summer of 1945, the insurgents stepped up their activities on the Polish border of Zakozonia which was inhabited by more than half a million Ukrainians. To protect the population there, the UPA command created a separate military district called Sian, consisting of several thousand insurgents. The inter-ethnic conflict between Poles and Ukrainians complicated the situation in the region. It was in these territories where, in 1942, the German occupying authorities deliberately provoked hostility between the two ethnicities, fueling a long-standing dispute over the right to the territory. Reich Commissar of Ukraine, Erich Koch, said, I would like the Pole to kill the Ukrainian and the Ukrainian to kill the Pole as soon as they meet. This provocative policy caused the bloody conflict to spread to Volynia and Galicia. Tens of thousands of innocent people on both sides were killed. With the arrival of Soviet troops, the communists escalated the inter-ethnic hatred. However, leaders of the Ukrainian and Polish underground movements managed to agree on a joint action against the communist regime. In August 1945, Zakozonia became part of communist Poland. We built a church with the hope that we would live here. But when the Soviets came the second time, a soldier told my elderly mother, you won't live here, this will be Poland. And then my mother told me this. I remember it well. She said the soldier said that this will be Poland. 
The governments of the USSR and Poland concluded an agreement on a population exchange in the border areas. As directed by the Kremlin, the Polish communist leadership tried every way possible to get the Ukrainians to move to the Soviet Union. Then they released those Bolshevik supporters who were acting just like gangs, assaulting and killing people at night and harassing everyone. They would attack, for example, a village, teachers, priests, other villagers, all of them such intelligent, educated people, and they would shoot them all to death. And in Brilinsi village they shot my friend's father, her whole family. She was the only one to survive, because she was away at the time. They went to the priest's home, but couldn't find him there, he was hiding. They could only get his elderly parents. So they thrust them on the floor, just think of it. And they took their time, put these two on the floor and placed a wooden board over them, making a sort of a seesaw, taking turns jumping on either side of it. They kept on jumping until his parents died under that board. That's what the deportation looked like. Such was the freedom we could enjoy. The main objective of UPA in Poland was to protect the population which was left without any defenses. My company was assigned to the border area, across from Birce. We had to establish control of the border on the Polish side, so we chased away the Polish border guards and now all that remained were border guards from the Soviet side. In 1945, Ukraine was free there, and we began establishing Ukrainian schools in the village. A pillar was erected, and on it was written that this is the UPA insurgent republic. Poles no longer went there. And when they went by the sign, they asked us to let them gather hay for the horses or to take some chickens, eggs. They did not dare do anything to the people or to take anything without asking. We allowed them to take some. In the evenings after work, people gathered and they were trained for the self-defense units. This was known as SKVU. The guys who belonged to the units learned military tactics, how to use weapons, and some history of Ukraine. The parents were very proud of their sons, who became their protectors. We had our own intelligence. Each company had its own intelligence service. They were in the field gendarmerie. Our civilian population also joined the intelligence services. I was sent to Kermanici to Burlaka the commander. So I got to his company, but I didn't give away my real name, only my alias. He eyed me up and down and asked, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to assist you and follow your orders. Then he said, I need an informant. I have to know what's going on in Paramashin. I need a courier to deliver everything like mail, notes, such kind of things. So I took up the job, I plunged into it. I got round the area, sometimes even 25 kilometers one way and 25 kilometers back, through different villages. And that was interesting. In Zakazonia, the UPA controlled communication lines, which gave it the opportunity to replenish its stocks of weapons, ammunition and uniforms by intercepting Soviet echelons carrying captured German equipment. 
It was already autumn of 1945. Our leadership and our commander received a message from Krakow that a train of goods will pass through our territory. We went to the village where we had to stop it. We blocked the station. The station's director was arrested. Everyone who worked at the station was arrested. We told him the cars of that train must be moved to the side tracks. Our commander came and met with a Soviet officer. We are the Ukrainian insurgent army, he said. What do you want, replied the Soviet officer. We need clothes and food. The Soviet officer thought and thought, then asked what would happen if they refused. We will open fire and you will die here. He then said, unlock the sixth and seventh cars and let them take what they want. We filled 40 wagons with what we needed, and after three, four hours, we let them go to the Soviet side. None of our soldiers were killed, and no Soviet guards were shot. UPA activity on the Polish-Soviet border gained increasing publicity. Only the complete deportation of Ukrainians from Zakazonia could undermine the insurgents' supply base and force them to leave the territory. For the Poles, it was advantageous, because they understood that it would be hard for them to fight the Ukrainians for a prolonged period of time. They couldn't understand the policy of our underground movement, just unable to. They would raid our villages, but only to find that half of the population had fled into the woods. The people didn't want it. They asked for our help. We then started defending them. So in the middle of 1946, we were able to stop the deportation of Ukrainians in some places. We destroyed the military base at the railway station in Vilshanitsa. We also blew up the bridge. In short, the Polish army was at war with us. They surrounded the village, surrounded our bases. On April 28, 1947, in Warsaw, with the support of Moscow and Prague, Operation Vistula was launched. Its aim was to deport Ukrainians to Western Poland and thereby destroy the remnants of UPA. The Soviet Union, Poland, and Czechoslovakia signed an agreement to jointly destroy units of the UPA in the Carpathians. That failed because in 1947, the leadership of the OUN and UPA decided that one unit would enter Galicia and continue the struggle. The other units then would go on a propaganda raid to Western Europe and spread the idea of the liberation struggle of the OUN UPA in the Lemko region and Ukraine in general. Every company withstood great pressure from the Polish army. Break through. We had to break through. We were surrounded. Break through in one direction. Fire your weapons. There was even this question, how many more rounds do you have? We had no contact and could not coordinate with one another. It was hard for us to cross the border. Even to reach the border was difficult. Troops were amassing at the border. The Poles saw everything. 
Whenever there was a window, 10 or 15 of us would cross the border. One night it could be 10 people, another night not no one. A window appeared, so we moved towards Tare Sambir in the Pre-Carpathians. So we went south and came to the old German-Soviet trenches. We occupied a mountain. We had nowhere to retreat, and we didn't have a reason to, because the Sian River was at our back. Commander Burlaka came and said, whoever has food, share it. Either we will leave this mountain and find food, or we will all die here together. The Polish artillery began preparation. Then shooting began over the trenches. There were many troops, Polish soldiers and Russian officers. The Poles stormed us. In Polish, they shouted, forward. The officers shouted in Russian, forward, damn it. We took position in the trenches and had to fight back. When we advanced, they parted, and during the chaos, we captured a Polish officer. Жити хочете? Кажіть, де, коли і з ким до нас ви мали бій? На тим дарані залишилися тільки ви. Спарті вже не чекайте. Решта з ваших одешла до американців на захід. Добра рада. Поддайтеся. The UPA command gave the order to leave Zakazonia. Under the enemy's onslaught, the remaining UPA units broke through Poland, Czechoslovakia and Austria to the territory of West Germany, which was controlled by US forces. In September 1947, the Hromenko platoon, having traveled a thousand miles, was one of the first units to enter the territory of Bavaria. Following it, throughout the year, small groups of insurgents followed. Stop where you are! Drop your weapons! You're in the American zone! Drop your weapons! Drop your weapons! No harm will be done! Cease fire! Drop your weapons down and proceed! Cease fire! Drop your weapons! Ukrainska postancha armia! Cease fire! Drop your weapons! You will be treated as prisoners of war! We were aware that we had to give up our weapons, but we would not surrender our weapons to the German police, only to the U.S. Army. We gave our weapons to the Americans and were interred in a camp. For almost a week, an old motel became our home. Every day, U.S. soldiers came and asked where we were and what we had seen. Everything was placed on the table, except our internal policies. From the article, Ukrainian resistors seized with U.S. aid, special to the New York Times, Munich, Germany, September 11. 
United States Constabulary troops at Passau near the Czech border, reinforcing the German state police, at 3 o'clock this morning rounded up and arrested 36 members of a Ukrainian resistance group who had marched into Bavaria from their home territory. From the article, Insurgency Behind the Iron Curtain, The Ukrainian Insurgent Struggle, from the German newspaper Die Zeit. The world found out about us. Maybe we'll find allies in this fight. We remain ready, expect new orders. Perhaps we will soon return to our homeland. After the last UPA units left Zakozonia, the insurgents' main fighting was concentrated in western Ukraine. After demobilization, fate brought me to Lviv. There was unrest in Lithuania, but in Lviv the situation was alarming. The population supported the Ukrainian insurgent army unconditionally. In western Ukraine, the population was particularly hostile toward the Soviet government, considering them occupiers. The vast majority of residents did not accept the aesthetic worldview that was instilled in the Soviet schools and universities. In addition, Soviet teachers were often used as agents by the communist secret services. Over there sat our school advisor and history teacher, as well as some young girls from the communist youth movement known as Komsomol. They said, today you will join the Komsomol. I said, I believe in God. Not a problem, they replied. And when I saw that it failed, I answered harshly, I believe in God, I'm not joining the Komsomol. There were four teachers, one of whom was playing with scissors. She was able to maneuver those scissors in a way that if an insurgent attacked her, she would be able to stab him with it. They would even question children, asking whether anyone had seen banderites or where the banderites were hiding. And the children would go home and naturally tell their parents that the teacher had asked them about the Banderites. So as soon as someone inquired about the insurgents, everyone knew immediately that was an enemy. If you're a teacher or a nurse, then you should stick to your job and not inquire about the Banderites. In 1947, most of the combat units of the UPA were concentrated in the Carpathians within the military district of Hovelia. Up until the last moment, the UPA leadership anticipated the beginning of World War III between the Soviet Union and the Western states. Therefore, in the event of changes in the geopolitical situation, the insurgent military structure was preserved. The insurgents built a system of underground bunkers called Kryivkas. They were used as headquarters, barracks, printing houses and hospitals. As such, Kryivkas were effective means of preserving human resources. A trench was dug out and then an earth roof would top that. Those bunkers couldn't last long. The Bolsheviks had two meter long iron rods, so up to that depth they could tell if there was something underneath or not. Untouched ground did not subside like the ground above a bunker. 
So we had to construct them in a very particular way. Special groups would make the entrance and go underground, and then they would start digging like moles. They had to excavate the soil and carry it on their backs at least a kilometer away. Because if somebody found soil nearby, they would know immediately there was a hiding place there. We had to devise a way to camouflage smoke rising from our bunker. The smoke had to exit somewhere. So we put an old hollow tree over the chimney, which was a tin rainwater pipe. Looking at the bunker, you would think it was an old willow. In order to ensure secrecy, Kriyevkas had to occasionally be modified to be built on the rugged, inaccessible slopes of the Carpathian Mountains. The insurgents would often live there six months at a time without ever exiting. And we would do it again and again. Every autumn we had to build a new bunker. But we could only carry out the construction while there were no shepherds nearby so that they couldn't see us. And that was really difficult. We had to be really quick, so we toiled day and night. It could be anything inside, but on the outside it had to be well disguised. We knew that the snow would fall and hide us. We had to stay underground for five months, at least five months, without going outside, without any fresh air apart from that coming through the air vent. We slept during the day. At night, we grinded on the millstone, baked, cooked. I cooked them. I had a table and stuff for this so that the boys could have something to eat. They could also study there in the winter. We read a lot. An entire Ukrainian encyclopedia was at our disposal, as well as many other different books. When we felt it was getting warmer, we could open the hatch slightly. The commander would first make sure we could get outside. This would usually happen in May, when we got out of the bunkers. Each year in May, but not always on the same day. When we emerged from the bunker and looked at our skin, it was as though we were corpses. During the winter, we all looked like corpses, emaciated and lifeless. Staying underground sucked out all the vital energy from us. Our memory would also deteriorate due to the lack of fresh air. We had to move slowly first, work out the joints, and eventually we would recover. After a few days, we would all be fit again. The insurgents' main objective was to prevent the Sovietization of Western Ukraine. Acts of diversion and sabotage against the Soviet administration were carried out. Elections were disrupted. Authorities and military forces were attacked and agents were eliminated. These were the strategies used in anti-colonial wars. It was a movement of passive resistance. One such episode was when a new first secretary was appointed in the Sokal district. He was a simple man, but very loyal to the communist cause. On Easter, he decided to organize a cleaning day to clean the whole city of Sokal. In the morning, everyone cleaned, and in the afternoon, everyone went home, even the activists. Where the manure came from, I don't know. But the two-story Communist Party building was covered in manure to the second floor. The 
The building was on a hill, and because of the incline, the manure flowed down the street. It remained a mystery. I'll tell you about the elections. At the time, I worked in the city council. Lists were made and all other arrangements for the election to be held. But I gave the order and we packed the lists into bags, took them away and burned everything outside some village. In the morning, the councillor arrived and wondered, what's going on? I said, I had no idea. We went to cut the wooden poles and knock them down. Do you think they fell? No, the wires held them up. We had to take an axe and chop the wires. Once the first one fell, it was like a domino effect. Even though they fell to the ground, there could still be a connection. So we chopped the wires with our axes just to make sure. To suppress the insurgent movement, one third of the internal troops of the MVD and the MGB of the USSR were deployed to Western Ukraine. In order to search for and eliminate insurgents, military secret service operations were conducted regularly. When encircled or during attempts to make arrests, insurgents committed suicide to avoid falling into the hands of the enemy alive and giving away others. And I hear my mother's voice. She says, Anna, get away from here. It scares me, as my mother died a few years before. I jump to my feet, and she says it again, get away, now. I rush outside through the hatch, and I see Commander Dovbush standing there and hear him shouting at me, hurry up. And as I get out, I hear somebody cock the gun. I managed to pull myself together and grasp the pistol. I was going to shoot myself. I remember that pistol. It failed. And I didn't have any other weapon, just a grenade on my belt. With my teeth, I pulled out the pin, and then I didn't know what I was doing, what happened. After some time, I recovered and found myself covered with soil all over, but alive, still alive. The granite did not blow me to pieces. Falling into their hands alive was frightful. I had already been beaten, tortured. I already knew those Bolshevik hands. It was much better just to die. He grabbed my arm to pull me, but it was nearly torn away from my body, hanging only by skin at my side. He let it go and grabbed my other arm. At that time, a doctor showed up and scolded the soldier. The doctor then took me in his arms and carried to the road. It felt as if I still had that arm. The pain was the same as in the other arm. I told them that I could still feel it, that my arm could be saved. But they didn't care. 
so that was impossible. As it was an explosive bullet, and all tendons and bones were all shattered, they couldn't save it. So I said, as I'm not going to live anyway, you can do whatever you want to. They took my arm, and the very next day I was brought in for the questioning, even though I was barely alive. The doctor said I had lost lots of blood. I only had half a liter of blood still running in me. When she was in the hospital, the doctor forbade the Czechists from interrogating her, so she would not die, because she had lost lots of blood. They came from Kiev and said, Well, Anka, tomorrow we will meet, and you will tell us the whole truth. Kupa intelligence decided to rescue her. That night, three boys changed their clothes in the guise of Soviets. One came and started speaking in Russian. The other shot at the men on duty. One stood at the entrance to the hospital and two on the second floor in the ward. I wasn't asleep. A soldier was sitting beside me on a chair. Then I heard the door slam loudly and then a machine gun burst. How could I know what all that shooting was about? Could I ever guess I was about to be freed? And then they shouted, don't be scared, we've come to rescue you. We crossed the river. My heel was bleeding as I was barefooted. The skin on the heel flayed, you could even see the flesh. Between Pnevye and Pasichny villages, we found a shelter in the shrubs. On the third day, a courier woman arrived, bringing us some food. She said the Bolsheviks were searching for us everywhere. 5,000 troopers. I was taken to the mountains, to Commander Dovbush. It was Lord's will that I survived. I went to the railway station to go to Rohatin. I was approached by two officers, a captain and lieutenant. They demanded my documents. I showed them my documents. Everything was in order. I was a displaced person from Poland. What is this? I fired four bullets at them. I didn't want to kill them, because the station was full of troops, and besides, it would not be in my favor. I began to run. And then suddenly I felt a blow. I was wounded. The bullet hit my chest. I fell to the ground and started crawling. I had such a strong desire to escape. Blood was flowing under my shirt. Everything was covered in blood. Then I decided to obey the order. Of course I could not let them take me alive. I took my pistol, placed it. And you know then a person becomes different. I remembered my whole life. Childhood and adolescence, parents and family. Just like in a kaleidoscope. I pulled the trigger, nothing. I tried a second time, third time. I forgot that after the fourth shot, my pistol would get jammed. For a long time, they were not there. I thought maybe they forgot about me. Finally, I heard cursing and someone calling after me. Then I saw the terrible red star on the forehead. I tried to pretend I was in shock. 
that I could not say anything, move anything. I was thrown in a cellar in Rohaten. I was surrounded by a pool of blood. I thought and thought. I came up with a story that I was abandoned in Poland, that I didn't know anyone here. I remembered I tried to believe in the words that I uttered. That was most important. So if I was woken from sleep, I would have been able to repeat the same thing. Then a month later, we were transported with a few prisoners in an open truck to Stanislav, ivano frankivsk where we were interrogated in compliance with all the Czechist rules, with beatings, terror, threats, promises. It was standard throughout. Adding to the strength of the military and the police were destruction battalions formed from the local population and insurgents who had surrendered, which were used to fight against the UPA. Товарищ старший лейтенант, бандиты, их много, сдаются, нужно подкрепление. Nazaruk's company appeared in Sokal around four in the afternoon. The men lined up in front of the police, set down their guns. They came to confess. The company surrendered. There was great commotion. The police called the border guards for help. But Nazaruk just gave up. Then Nazaruk was turned and was made a commander of a Soviet assault battalion. The command of the Ukrainian insurgent army had a security service, its own prosecutors, pronounced Nazaruk the death sentence and carried it out. The MGB created special intelligence military groups. Under the guise of UPA fighters, they took leaders captive, carried out all sorts of provocations and committed crimes against civilians. The main purpose of these special operations was to discredit the insurgents. A so-called maneuver group operated in Sokal. These were border guards. They all knew the Ukrainian language. Some Banderites were in this group. Those who were captured, sentenced to death, and then told that if they cooperated with the sabotage squad, they would live, and they did. During the day, they went around Sokal, dressed as border guards, while in the evening they wore civilian clothes, like the Banderites, and went through the villages and did their dirty work. They dealt with the activists. With extraordinary cruelty, they threw them into wells, tortured boys and girls, and accused them of working with the KGB. The boy swore that never in his life did he work with anyone. On the contrary, he said he was a civilian messenger and said who he knew from the insurgents. Who can vouch for you? Well, he told them, and then they arrested that person. Many activists and members of the resistance movement were caught with this method. 
In response, Upa insurgents began to mine empty bunkers, forest trails, and buildings. An effective system of communication that ran through the underground network was established. Whenever the insurgents came, they would wait for me to get outside so that they could make sure it was me. Each of them had his own sign. One, if he arrived at night, would press his hand against the window. Others would wave handkerchiefs, some would whistle. There were all sorts of signs. So then I would rush to them and they would tell me what to do, whether to cook some food or deliver a message to someone. There was nothing to eat in the winter. Those insurgents arrived from Zelena village at their own risk, because if they were to come across the patrol, they had to shoot themselves. So they arrived and hid in the stable. At that time, there were raids in the woods organized by the Soviets. And there they were. Ten of them got down from the mountain with a dog and right into our house. We would like to cook some food here. And I thought, oh Lord, is that what you want? The dog under the table. And I could only pray that they didn't go into the stable. Hey girl, how about some milk? But of course, here you are, my dear. And I was trying hard to be nice to them and taking good care of them, because I knew there would be tragedy if I don't prevent it. So I treated them very well, with great hospitality. As their senior officer was shaving, I found some cologne for him. Boys, I'll sprinkle you with some of it so that girls loved you. So I sprinkled them with cologne and they went away. Their dog confused by the odor. They didn't even try looking anywhere, because they didn't feel something was wrong. I was given the task to observe and write an overview of events. According to instructions, we gathered information on the number of NKVD arriving to the village, what weapons they had, and what they were up to. We watched them closely and remembered everything, and I recorded it each day. I wrote step by step. I wrote about 1944, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, to April 12, 1950, when I was arrested. In 1950, the Soviets completed the collectivization and passportization of the Western regions. This undermined the insurgents' food and supply base. The most active part of the population was deported to Siberia. While most people who remained were increasingly losing faith in the success of further combat.
By the spring of 1954, there were only a few isolated groups of insurgents, among whom there was no communication for more than half a year. One of the last pockets of resistance was in Commander Hrim's Carpathian region. By May 1954, only three remained in the Kryivka. I felt something was going to happen to us and kept saying that something terrible was going to happen because I had a prophetic dream. In the morning I was already awake and heard some noise about the bunker. I decided to have a look and when I opened the hatch and had a look, I caught a glimpse of the Soviets hiding in the shrubs. The commander's wife did not believe me, but the commander said that time has come. And so we spent the whole day negotiating with those above the bunker. The Soviets were advising our commander to let the women go. But he said, my women are strong, they can withstand anything. I wonder what would happen if you captured me alive. The NKVD officer replied, the women should surrender, but you, you judge yourself. I give you five minutes. I gave them the shirts to change into. I had embroidered them for their birthday. There was this rule among the seniors not to get into the Bolsheviks' hands alive. You had to shoot yourself with the last bullet. Blood was spurting from his mouth. He asked me, are you still alive? I said, yes, I am. He was asking me not to let him get into their hands alive and that I had to shoot myself last. But I was standing there in a state of shock. I no longer had control over myself. I'd had too much for me that day, too long without fresh air. And I can't remember now what was happening in those last minutes. I'd say some higher power pulled me out of there. The power of Lord. I don't know. I don't understand how I could have fallen in their hands alive. But I just couldn't do it. I had no weapon. Some fighters of the underground continued to resist the Soviet system until the beginning of the 1960s. Others hid from Soviet rule for decades and came out of hiding only after the independence of Ukraine in 1991. and both my father and my brother died for Ukraine, and so I had to follow the same way. They asked me, why did you join the UPA? The Germans robbed us, beat us, took us to Germany. Why should I have gone to Germany? I joined the UPA. Later it turned out that I fought against the USSR. What could I do? 
They called them fascists, but in fact they were all men who loved Ukraine, who sacrificed their lives for their country. He was 20 years older, and I say to him, for me it's hard, for you it's not, and he says to me, Savchuk, but for our children it will be good. I serve in the UPA. I'm fighting for the Christian faith. If we never meet alive, then we will meet in the valley of Jehoshaphat. Then he sang the Ukrainian national anthem and shot himself. And how many were taken to Siberia? They wouldn't even give us half an hour to pack. They would arrive in order, pack and away with you. My life was in the hands of God. Faith in God, faith in the fact that I had to survive, and all the prayers of my mother. It was the miracle of God. God saved me. It was God's power that saved me there. It was a true miracle.